Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As you take a look at the fourth chapter of Hebrews, and you simply read through that chapter, whatever translation of the, the Bible you're reading, uh, there is so much contained in there that seems like kind of strange to us. The whole talking about the Sabbath, the whole talking about rest, uh, the whole business of, of what does that mean and where did that come from and how do we have this concept and all of this, which of course the author to the Hebrews is taking for granted because he is addressing his letter to the Hebrews who understand Sabbath, they understand where it comes from, they understand how it's kept, and all of those kinds of things. And that's the reason I read the section from Matthew uh, Gospel, the 11th chapter, because 11th and 12th chapters, because it is in there that the Lord has to actually address this whole thing of Sabbath uh, with the Pharisees. And he ends that section by saying that uh, uh, the, the one that God has sent, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And therefore the Sabbath is really in Him. <coughs> And that's what Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, tries to teach us, is that our Sabbath is in Christ. And so, I'm going to use some acrostics today. You have those on your page. If you have a pen or pencil or something, you can fill in. I'm going to use acrostics. It's a teaching technique uh, of using acrostics. You usually just put a word uh, written vertically on the left side of a page, and then each uh, letter of that word, whatever the word might be, uh, means something that is related to what you want to learn. All right? The one that everybody is familiar with is the mother. You know, I mean, how many Mother's Day sermons have we had, had that done for us, the mother acrostic? And, and even a song was written about it, right? Which even made it easier to, to memorize was they made a song about, you know, mother. And so you have it there and... What does the elm stand for? For the million things, you know, she gave me. Okay, M is for the million things she gave me. What does the O stand for? It means only that she's growing old. <laughs> what does the T stand for? In our case, yes, we're, we're kind of there, aren't we? The T, her tears that uh, she uh, shed to save me. H is for her heart, her heart of purest gold. E is for the eyes and loving light shining there. And the R means right. And right she always was. <laughs> you put them all together and they spell mother. Mother. The word that means the world to me. And so most people are very familiar with that. People have learned that over the years and uh, know it and are familiar with it. Uh, so it's very good to, to have something like that in our lives. When I was in graduate school, uh, the amount of materials, and this is true for a lot of people that are in graduate school, a lot of material that you have is just sometimes overwhelming. The stuff you have to read, the stuff you have to retain, uh, and then, of course, you're, you're, you're tested on that. You're tested on all of that. And um, I remember taking my uh, undergraduate exam, my undergraduate exam, and we were given, remember all the, the little comp composition books called the blue books? Everybody was given a blue book, all right? And this was the final exam. Write down everything you've learned in the last four years. <laughs> First thing I wrote down is not to come to this exam. <laughs> yeah, you had, you had two hours to write everything you'd learned, supposedly, in, that, in the four years been there. And so I said, I've got to do better than this uh, when I get in graduate school. So I would take all the concepts, or whatever concepts I would have to learn, and I would simply make an acrostic. And I would uh, put the acrostic, and so when, as soon as the exam was handed out, I'd turn it over and I'd write the acrostic down the side of the exam. And then I'd write the word, the main focus on each one of those down on the exam. All my uh, classmates wanted my notes. I should have sold them, you know. Of course, we didn't have an internet. I couldn't sell them on the internet back then in those days. The point of the matter being, acrostics are very easy to, a way to learn things and to remember things. And uh, sometimes when we're trying to recognize or understand what is uh, a particular chapter in the Bible, like the uh, fourth chapter of Hebrews, what is it trying to teach us about what Jesus himself says, that he's the Lord of the, uh, of the Sabbath, 
there in Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter. So how do we do that? Well, I have a little acrostic here that I want to share with you called Gospel. And the reason I share this, this acrostic before we get to the one about Hebrews is because it's really about the Gospel. Whatever you're going to read in the New Testament has its center and, and its, its heart and its content in the Gospel. If you're reading the Acts of the Apostles, if you're reading the letters of Paul, if you're reading Hebrews, James, or any of the other letters of the, of the, of the New Testament, the heart of everything that is there is the Gospel. So I want to use an acrostic for the Gospel, which is very easy for you to, to learn. And you can write it down there so you can learn it very... And this is a great witnessing tool. Because if we're going to ever be with somebody and explain the Gospel just very simply to someone... This gospel acrostic is very, very easy to use. And we can just bring the whole gospel to them uh, about God's love and God's saving work in Jesus. So, uh, G-O-P, G-O-S-P-L-E, gospel. The good news, all right? The first one, the G is God loves you. That's the first thing you want people to know. God loves you, John 3, 16. God so loved you. So God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. So John 3, 16. That's a very simple thing to start with. God loves you. you know? I said that to a young woman one time, and she, and she said, does He really love me? And I said, He loves especially you. Of course He does. God loves you. Secondly, our sins have separated us from God. Okay? God's love is out there. God's love is real. But our sins separate us from that real love of His. Okay? That's Isaiah 59 too. For your sins have separated you from me, the Lord says. So, our sins are a, something that separates us from God. S stands for sin. Sin has been paid for, has been paid for you by Jesus' death on the cross. So, sin, your sin, your sin has been paid for you by Jesus. Uh, Christ's death on the cross. And there's so many scriptures that speak to that. Uh, Romans 3.25 talks about the fact that we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Romans 4.7 repeats that. Revelation 1.5, uh, right there at Revelation, I am the, I am the one, uh, the Lamb, you know, who has, who has uh, taken away the sins of the world. And that sort of thing. So Jesus has paid that your sin is now covered. P stands for people must believe in Jesus Christ to be saved. So you have to take in by faith that Jesus has done that for you. He has taken your sin away. Okay, that's Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There's one name given under heaven by which men must be saved. And the name he's talking about there is Jesus. Okay, and then again in Acts 16.31. It is that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Is, you must believe on Jesus Christ and be saved. So uh, uh, people must believe. And then E is for eternal life is a free gift. It's a free gift. God has freely given you eternal life for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that's in Romans 6.23. That we all have this life uh, because of what God has done. It is a free gift of God in Christ, this eternal life. And then, loving others is our calling in Christ. So you have a calling now. Now that you have believed the gospel, you see, you have a calling, and that calling is to love others. To love other people. As Jesus Christ says in John 13, 34 and 35, love one another even as I have loved you, this is how they will know you're my disciples, by how you love one another. So love then becomes. So we start with God loves you, and then we end with that is our calling. It's the calling of everyone who's come to the gospel is to love others for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's your calling. So that's just a very simple gospel acrostic. Now, perhaps some of you have seen this before or even heard of this before. But that's a very simple one that helps us focus on exactly what the gospel is. It's very, very simple. So with this teaching in mind, then I want to go to uh, 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 illustrate what uh, 
Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about it. It's really talking about rest. And what does that rest mean? We're going to use an acrostic there. And when you put the acrostic together, R-E-S-T is receive eternal security today. Receive eternal security today is what that is. And that is exactly what Hebrews is saying. And, and how do we know that? We know that because of the text. If you look at the text of Hebrews 4, what does he talk about there? He talks about rest. And he talks about the Jews receiving this Sabbath rest. Now we all know from the Old Testament where the Sabbath comes from. The Sabbath comes from Genesis, the second chapter, where it says on, uh, uh, on the six, six days God created the entire universe, man, everything put man in it, took care of everything. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the works that He had done. He rested from His work. And the word Sabbath, it means, Sabbath means rest from work. I mean, that's what the word means. Sabbath is to rest from your work. And it's sanctified by God who rested from His work of creation on the seventh day. And it was established from the very beginning. From the very beginning of humanity, uh, in creation, this rest was established. It's one day out of seven to rest. Okay, uh, and it was the it was the the Sabbath was the first day of the week uh, uh, of the week. I mean, the last day of the week, the Sabbath. So in our calendar, it would have been Saturday, but they changed it to a solar calendar. Uh, you know, back in ancient times, and so now Sunday became the first day. But then it was Saturday was was uh, the last day, Sunday the first, on the lunar calendar. Now. As we understand this, this is repeated. Now, what, what the Hebrew author is trying to say here is, we received this command of the Sabbath from God to rest in God. The whole idea of the Sabbath was to rest from the work to give thanks to God. It was all about resting to remember God. That was from ancient times. Moses was given that law. Moses was given it in a, in a law in the Ten Commandments. You shall keep uh, the Sabbath day holy. Seven days you shall work, but on the Sabbath you shall do no work. And then it goes on a long thing about your slave will not, and you will not, and all this kind of You will give your animals rest and all of this business, right? He mentions that. Hebrews mentioned that it goes back to there. But he also mentions this something in there. He says, the people of Israel came out of Egypt where there was no rest. It wasn't like they got a seventh day off from being slaves. They worked all the time. Every day they had to work as slaves. And so God comes in and He rescues them from that, promising to take them to a land where they will have rest. Take them from out of this bondage of slavery into a place of rest. And that was the promised land. It was the promised land. But if you read Deuteronomy, I mean, if you read Numbers chapter 3 through 14, you will find out that what did the Jewish people do when they finally came to the river and Moses sent spies over? Remember what happened? So he sends 12 spies over, you know, to, to spy out the land. They come back, only two give a good report. Ten say, oh, there's giants in the land. They live in these huge fortified cities. They'll squash us like bugs. It, it, it's, we can no way that we can take them. We can't live in that land. Who can overcome anything? Joshua and Caleb said, the Lord's with us. Let's go take the land. We can have this. And we, they, it says they did not enter their rest. Hebrews comments on this. They didn't enter their rest. God gave it to them, but they didn't enter it. They didn't enter it. Also, when they finally did enter the land, and they took the land, and eventually they came to the kingship of David, the king to which God said He would establish His throne forever. And He comes to David. Yet David wrote a psalm, Psalm 95. And in Psalm 95... What he did in Psalm 95 is he cataloged everything that we should be praising God for. And at the end of that psalm, he says, 
But do not harden your hearts as in the day in the wilderness at Marah. Do not harden your hearts like they did when they were on the cusp of the Jordan and were given the land that they did not receive. Did not receive. He said, I have sworn an oath, the Lord says, they shall not enter my rest because they would not receive what I gave them. And, and David, even at the time of David, he reminds them, reminds the people of Israel, you must enter this rest of God that He has promised you. God has promised it to you. And you know what has happened. Solomon comes in and builds the greatest kingdom that was ever in Israel. You know, but then it, it became divided became, it becomes, he became unfaithful and it was divided once again so we, we, we cannot fail to go into the rest, into his rest so when Jesus comes who is the prince of peace when he comes, what does he say to the people in Matthew 11 and 12 he says to them, you must take, uh, come to me for I will relieve you of your burdens. You will find rest for your souls. You're going to find true rest in me. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. Learn from me to rest in the Lord. Do you think Jesus ever really uh, was afraid? Do you think he ever thought, where's my next meal going to come from? Did you think he ever thought, how am I going to get to this place or that place? In his entire ministry, you know, now, he had to go places to keep himself safe, obviously. But did you think he ever really worried about it? No, because he knew. He knew all along where the end was going to be for him. He knew where it was going to be. And it was going to be on the Mount of Ascension. And he knew that he would go through all of this. So he was never worried that he would ultimately enter the rest of the Father. And so he would promise that to his disciples, that they would enter that rest. I tell you, I will give you rest. Now, it's available for you. And that's what this is all about. That rest is available for you. The rest that the author to the book of Hebrews is saying here in the fourth chapter, it's for you today. And that's why he says, for there is a today. If they had entered the rest on the day God gave them, then why would he say today? As if there were another day. There is a day. There's the day for you to enter the day has been established by Jesus Christ's cross and resurrection. Now you have that today. And that's why uh, Paul said, today is the day of your salvation. Enter it today. It is eternal. This rest is not something anyone can take away from you. It cannot be taken away from you. No matter what you go through, it cannot be. St. Paul, when he had gone to Rome, he, was, he had appealed to the emperor... They were, going to, they were going to put him to death in Jerusalem because uh, they felt that he was blaspheming the temple, which was a death sentence for blaspheming the temple. And he appealed to Caesar. Well, he was first taken to Caesarea and uh, was put in jail there for a while. And uh, I had the opportunity to actually stand right in the area where he was imprisoned uh, when I was there in, in, in Israel. And so they took him there and they, they had him there and he had through, went through a couple of trials but, apparent, but he realized he was not going to get any justice there because the Pharisees had come down from Jerusalem all falsely accusing him, so he, so he appealed to Caesar. He was a Roman citizen. I appealed to Caesar. So he was taken to Rome. When he was taken to Rome, it is, it is believed that although he was an imperial prisoner, he may have even traveled to Spain. He did not let anything stop him from preaching the gospel. Nothing stopped him. He did not worry about where he was going to get a meal. He didn't worry about what prison he was going to be in. When I was in Rome, I visited the, the, the prison area on, on the uh, Cappadocio, uh, where he was probably kept. And, and he didn't care about that. All he wanted to do was be in the rest of Christ, to rest with Christ. That's what he says in Philippians. For me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. And that's how he lived his life. You're invited to go into that same kind of rest. It's an eternal rest. It's a rest that we have right now. All of us who are believers in Jesus Christ don't just have eternal rest when we die. You know, you know the old Latin phrase, requiem in pacem, you know, rest in peace, which is we'll put over the uh, tombs of many of the saints, right? No, we already have that rest. It's eternal. It's ours 
today. That's why the book of Hebrews in four chapter four talks about today, today, because he's talking to people who missed it in the days past, and he's saying now is the day today. And so it's eternal. It's for you now. It's not something you're going to get later on. Now, obviously, you're going to have it in its fullness in the presence of God later on, certainly. But it's yours now. You are an eternal person. You're a person who will not die eternally. You will live forever from this moment on. This is the day of your salvation. That's what he wants these Jewish people he's writing to the, the author of Hebrews, that's what he's saying to them. Let this be your today, where you come to that faith in Jesus Christ that is gives you eternal life. And it's so many times in the scriptures where Jesus talked about uh, the Son of Man giving you eternal life. And if you want to write down a scripture by eternal there, the scripture to write down is John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, it goes on and on and on about uh, and I will raise you up on the last day, and you will have life. And anybody who eats the blood, uh, uh, body and drinks the blood of some man uh, will have life in him. Uh, this is eternal, eternal. Then S. It's an eternal security. This eternal life that you have is completely secure. Now, why is it completely secure? Because it doesn't depend on anything you've done or will do. And it doesn't depend on any, uh, you can't lose it unless you abandon it. Right? You can't lose it. It's not like, it's like you know, a person who comes to faith, like Simon Magus in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles. Simon uh, in Samaria. Simon was a magician and he became very powerful and very influential. And he depended on, on his uh, prestidigitation and his, his, his use of the occult. And he depended on that. But he became a believer and actually was baptized. He was actually baptized. So he came. He, he came to know Jesus. He came to learn. Heard the gospel preached to him. Okay? Alright? So he learned that God loved him. He learned that he had eternal life. He learned that he had security in Christ for everlasting life. He learned all those things. But he went away from them. Now, if, if, if he went away from them, did he lose them? No, he didn't lose them. He abandoned them. You don't lose something you've abandoned. Because you know where it still is. Now, everyone who walks out of the church says, I'm never, going to, I'm never going to go to the church again. Everyone who walks away from Christianity says, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. Okay? It's not like they don't know where it is. But they've suddenly forgotten. It's like they woke up in a new world that didn't have a church or didn't have Christianity or didn't have Jesus. It's not like that. They know exactly where it is. It's not that they've lost it. They've abandoned it. And you're free to do that. You're free to abandon it if you want to, just like Simon Magus was free to, to, to abandon. Like many people we have in our society that we know who have the right to abandon it if they want to. Does it mean it went away? No, it doesn't. It's like the person who's given a great endowment when a, a relative dies, and they're given this endowment of millions of dollars. They know exactly where it is, but they may choose never to, to, to receive it, never to ask for it, never to take it. We have this eternal security in Christ. It cannot be lost because it's secured in Him, in Him, and it's there for you anytime you turn to Him in repentance and faith. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the very chapter we're talking about, let us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Having been in the pastoral ministry for over 40 years, I, you know, I, I have heard people, and perhaps you have heard people like this, who have said, you know, I've been away for so long. I've just been away for so long. I don't know if I can come back. Uh, I don't know, you know. And I've heard that. I've heard that from people. I've been away too long, you know. Uh, I don't know if I would fit in. or All kinds of excuses that they might give. And yet, it says right here, it's, don't worry about it. Come to the throne of grace. That's why it's there. It never moved. It was like the guy that's driving down the road. You know, he's driving down the road. His wife, they've been married back about 120 years. And uh, so, they've been married a long time. So, he's driving down the road. You know, he's got his glasses down like this. He's driving. And his wife is sitting over here, right? And they're sitting in an old pickup truck. And, uh, you know, she sits there. And she says, you know... You know, when we were younger, we used to sit next to each other. 
when we drove. And the old man looks over and said, yeah, I didn't move. <laughs> He's always there. He didn't move. He's always there. He didn't move. You know, and, but we can move away. We can, but he's still always there, always there for us to come. And that's, that's what he means. We have this confidence that we can always draw near to that throne of grace in that time of need. So it's secure, totally secure. John 14 is a great place to look in for that. John 14, here's a great, I love this text for security. When it comes to eternal security, I love this text. Uh, John 14 verses 1 through 3 uh, says uh, something to the effect. Uh, some texts say trust in God. Some say believe in God. I like the one believe in God. But you can say trust in God if you want to. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, will I not come back and receive you so that where I am you may be also? That's security. That's what we have. That's what he told his disciples before he was crucified and buried. That's what he told them. And that's what he's telling us. So this receiving this eternal security starts today. If you've not received this, if you have any doubts in your mind that God has saved you through Jesus Christ, if you have any doubts in your mind that you are a saved son and daughter of the King, then receive it today. You can receive it today. In John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Now John, uh, the first chapter, has a long prologue. First 18 verses basically. It's a very long prologue. Because he's going to introduce, he's introducing his audience to who this Jesus really is. And you have the most sayings of Jesus. The most sayings of Jesus are in John's gospel. They're written in, in the gospel of John. And he wants you to hear from Jesus who he really is. But he gives this long prologue. And you know the beginning, uh, how it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were created through him. And without him, nothing was created that has been created. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. That's how it begins. But he goes down in verses, uh, in, um, verses uh, 1 to, uh, I'm sorry, verses um, in, first John, uh, in, in, in the chapter of John there, he goes into how they are children of God in John uh, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. This is what he says. But to all who receive Him, who believed in His name. Now the name here is Jesus, which means Savior. Jesus just means God saves or Yahweh saves. Who believed in His name as the Son of God, get, He gave the right to to become children of God. So, that's what we are. And this is what he goes on. Who were born, not of blood. Which means you don't get to be this because you happen to have been born Christian. You don't get this because you happen to have been born Jewish. You don't get this from any kind of blood, except that of Jesus, of course, but any human blood. Nor from the will of the flesh, that is, that a person wants to have a child. Or from the will of man, as in marriage or something like that, or in the family. But of God. You have been, you have been born of God. And that is by faith. And so by faith you get born of God. You're a child of God. You have received Jesus Christ. You have received, you have received this eternal security today. In Jesus Christ. It's yours. It's yours. And no one can take it from you. No one can take it from you. It's, it's not possible. Uh, you, you cannot. Uh, there was a woman uh, in, uh, I think she was in uh, Pakistan. Uh, and she had, um, uh, she had given a, a cup of water. Uh, there was a, there was a beggar or some person that needed a cup of water. And she was doing exactly what the gospel said. Anyone who gives a cup of water to the least of these, they've done it for me. You know, anyone who gives it, you're, you, will not, you will surely not lose your reward, it says. So she gave this cup of water to this person. 
And she had a couple of her Muslim neighbors stand, a couple of women Muslims, a neighbor stand there. She was a Christian. She, she gave the water to the person. And, and she witnessed to the person about Jesus Christ, how much God loved him and Jesus Christ. Well, these two women informed on her. They informed on her that she was blaspheming against Muhammad and, and the Quran by trying to proselytize uh, this person. She has been on death row now for almost six years, in fact, for simply doing that. Uh, for almost six years now in, pa in Pakistan. And uh, every time they're going to decide her case, uh, in which she will be hanged if, uh, if it's decided against her. Uh, but if um, every time they try to do, they delay and delay and delay and delay. And she's become a political basketball now. Uh, but her life has just been completely put aside. She's not allowed to speak to anybody or be in the uh, regular women's prison population because she'll witness about Jesus, so they won't let her there. She's left in solitary confinement. Can't see her family. Hasn't seen her family. It's incredible what she is. And yet, and yet, everyone who believes on his name, who has received him and believed on his name, has been given right to be called a child of God. And that's exactly what she knows she is. And she has eternal security in that. Term. Now, the church in this country is fighting like unbelievably. You know, there's, all, there's over half a million signatures have been sent to Pakistan to release her. Okay? So clearly we're trying, as brothers and sisters of hers, to do something about it. But her faith has held and held and held uh, because she's a child of God and she has nothing to fear. She has nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. In Hebrews chapter 4, then, this is how it finishes, verses 11 through 16. If you want to receive eternal security today, if you want to rest, you want rest in God today, listen to, to this. Let us therefore strive to enter this rest. Okay? So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What disobedience? The disobedience of the Jews not to enter that rest? The disobedience of those that followed Solomon's reign to maintain that rest in the, in the promised land until they eventually lost it in the Babylonian captivity? And when the Babylonians finally took the land, okay, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, even to the joints and of marrow. In other words, there's nothing physical and there's nothing spiritual that cannot be touched by the word of God. That, that we need to fear that is touched. Because as long as we have abandoned disobedience, his word will do its work. If you'll let his word do his work in you, it will do his work. Just as the surgeon takes the knife to heal when necessary in the physical body, God takes the sword of his spirit, the word of God, to heal us in the spiritual. And that is what's happening to us. That is open to you. It's all ready for you. The discerning of thoughts and intentions of the heart. And he, everyone who wants this rest, will get this rest if they will come to Christ, everyone. Since then, we have a great high priest. Listen now. They had a high priest that would go into the sanctuary once a year and then offer this sacrifice for the sins of the whole nation on the, on the, uh, on the Day of Atonement. Okay? And he had to do it every year. Why did he have to do it every year? Because the people sinned. And every year they had to be forgiven. And the high priest himself had to offer a sacrifice for himself first before he took the people's sacrifice. And why? Because he was a sinner too. But we have a high priest. We have a high priest now that has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. And let us hold fast to that confession that he is the eternal high priest. For he did not... We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one that in every respect was tempted just as we have been, but without sin. He is the sinless high priest. So let us then with confidence draw near. The verse I had quoted just now. To the throne of grace, brothers and sisters. Let's have this, this rest. Let's receive this eternal security in Jesus Christ today. Every one of us. For there we are going to find mercy at that throne of grace and help in the time of need. Amen? Amen. 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 Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, even to life everlasting. Amen.